Well, good evening. <laughs> Friends, Please good welcome. evening. It's, it's really wonderful to be back in the world, back at an event like this one. And so welcome to Legal Aid's 32nd Annual Servant of Justice Awards Dinner. It is uh, so nice to see all of you in person, in 3D. It has been a long time for many of us, but tonight we have the best reason to gather and celebrate. We are here to honor several extraordinary individuals who have worked tirelessly to ensure that all people have equal and meaningful access to justice. And most importantly, we are here to support legal aid, their clients, and their mission to make justice real for DC residents. Together, Together, we have raised a record $1.72 million for legal aid. This is quite an impressive way to return to our first in-person event since 2019. Thank you to my fellow co-chairs, Chioma, Raj, and Kara and the several leaders who are part of the benefit committee for this year's efforts. And thank you to the sponsors and supporters who have made this year's dinner such a resounding success. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge our 2021 honorees who regrettably were not able to receive their recognition in person. The Servant of Justice honorees, John Heinz of Blank Rome, and Avis Buchanan of the Public Defender Service of the District of Columbia. The Klepper Prize recipient, Elliot Weingartner, and the Partnership Award honoree, Cynthia Spencer. I know several of these honorees may be watching live stream tonight, so please let's give them a round of applause. I also want to thank the co-chairs for the event and the benefits committees for 2020 and 2021. In one year, we had to cancel the dinner altogether. In the other, we held the event virtually. And under difficult and unusual circumstances, they stepped up and were able to sustain support for legal aid. Thanks to you and the support of so many here in the room, Legal Aid has been able to continue its important work of assisting low-income DC residents during exceedingly challenging times. Now, I, I can't talk about the success of this year's dinner without thanking the many sponsors who increased their support this year, 36 to be exact. But one firm in particular must be mentioned because thanks to them, we now have a new top sponsorship tier of sponsors who contribute $200,000 or more to the dinner. I present to you this year's Trailblazer for Justice, the law firm Kirkland and Ellis. Thank you so much. You've really set the bar high, and I can only hope that we will see others joining you at this level in future years. I also want to recognize our three champions of justice this year, Latham and Watkins, Sitley and Scadden. And our pro protector of justice, Covington. and our leaders of justice, Austin and Bird, Steptoe, and Wilmer Hale. Yeah. 
and our defenders of justice, Arnold and Porter, Dittens, Mayor Brown, and Paul Weiss. And a heartfelt thank you to the rest of our sponsors, all of whom are included in the complete listing in our program booklet. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the dinner's corporate honor roll, and I am exceedingly proud to have KPMG uh, under the leadership of our regional office managing partner, uh, Timothy Gillis, who's here tonight, among that group this year. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Wilma Liebman, who will present the Klepper Prize for Volunteer Excellence. Wilma is a past chairman of the National Labor Relations Board and a close friend to Arlene and Marty Klepper. The Klepper Prize was created by Arlene and Marty, the latter of whom served as president of Legal Aid's board, to recognize attorneys who have made significant volunteer contributions early in their careers. Please join me in welcoming Wilma. Thank you, Tana. And on behalf of Marty and Arlene Klepper, I am pleased to pre present this year's Klepper Award on two outstanding attorneys from Crowell and Mourning, Matthew Cohen and Aaron Marks. Matt and Aaron have been involved with Legal Aid's pro bono program since 2016 and 18, respectively. In that time, they each have handled several housing cases, including representing a single mother with two children who was facing eviction from the subsidized apartment where her family had lived for many years, and also litigating and settling an eviction case for a senior citizen and veteran who fell behind on his rent. By taking on multiple cases and building expertise over time, Matt and Aaron have been able to handle increasingly complex matters, as well as supervise and mentor other attorneys at their firm. Their work and mentorship has been critical to Crowell and Mooring's active participation in the citywide Housing Right to Council project. That project focuses on representing tenants in subsidized and low rent housing who are facing ev eviction proceedings and are most at risk of long-term displacement or homelessness. Before and during the pandemic, Matt and Aaron have continued to zealously advocate for their clients. And in so doing, they have ensured that their clients were able to keep their housing subsidies and preserve long-term affordable housing and stability for their families. It is my great pleasure, therefore, to present the 2022 Klepper Prize for Volunteer Excellence to Matthew Cohen and Aaron Marks. Their pro bono commitment truly exemplifies the spirit of the Klepper Prize. I extend congratulations to both of them for Marty and Arlene Klepper. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much to everyone at the Legal Aid Society. Uh, it's a wonderful honor to receive the Klepper Prize tonight. Uh, first, let me thank my clients for trusting me to represent them. Uh, I'd like to thank all the paralegals, associates, and partners at Kroll who supported me and mentored me, uh, especially uh, Jessica Bartlett, Kenzel Smith, Ade Johnson, Matt Gander, Justin Kingsolver, Nadi Nagendra, John McCarthy, uh, Dan Campbell, and John Brew, and Dan Canistra. Thank you all. Uh, and of course, uh, Beth Mellon from Legal Aid, who always had time to help me with the most difficult legal questions. And finally, I'd like to thank my wonderful partner, Michelle King, for all her love and support. Uh, when I came to Kroll and Mooring, I knew I wanted to work in eviction defense. Uh, as a college student, I once sued a landlord for the return of my security deposit. Uh, <laughs> the air conditioner had broken and leaked into the floorboards, causing massive damage. 
and even though I'd reported the leak to maintenance, the landlord still blamed me for the damage when it was never fixed. The $3,000 I kept was more money than I made in a month. Uh, it was more money than I had in my savings. And without that money, there was no way I could have hired an attorney to recover it. Luckily, the university provided me with an attorney who helped me sue the landlord and get my money back. She never charged me a dime. It was included in the cost of tuition. That experience, along with fighting a speeding ticket I got on my 29th birthday, was what made me want to go to law school in the first place, uh, to be able to help others in the way that someone helped me, to pay forward the charity and support which I received. Representing low-income tenants in eviction proceedings is both a challenging and rewarding effort, but the reward isn't really for us, it's for the people we help. For us, winning a case or reaching a favorable settlement might just be another day in the office. But for that, that win often means our clients can remain in their homes. I'm honored to be able to use my skills to help others in the same way that others helped me, and I'm truly humbled to accept this award. Thank you. Good evening. And likewise, I am truly humbled to stand here this evening as a co-recipient of this year's Klepper Prize for Volunteer Excellence. I extend my deepest gratitude and appreciation to Mr. and Mrs. Martin and Arlene Klepper and their family and to the Legal Aid Society of the District of Columbia for this honor. Over my brief career, I've had the privilege of working with Legal Aid's extraordinary staff to serve clients on housing law matters, specifically defending tenants from eviction in DC's landlord-tenant court. I have found few things as rewarding, both professionally and personally, as helping neighbors typically disadvantaged and facing life's toughest challenges maintain a roof over their head and ensure that basic human right remains intact. If there is one lesson that I've learned from partnering with Legal Aid on landlord-tenant cases, it is that having legal representation truly matters. In DC, nine out of 10 landlords have legal representation, while nine out of uh, 10 tenants do not. This is not justice, I'm sorry, this is not access to justice for all. It is important, therefore, that we do what we can to level the playing field when so much is at stake, a person's home. As a legal community, we have a unique and collective responsibility to ensure that all parties have equal access to justice, irrespective of wealth or status. In addition to the Kleppers and Legal Aid, I would also like to thank my colleagues at Kroll and Mooring, particu particularly former DC Bar President and our pro bono partner, Susie Hoffman, and the firm's managing partner, Phil and Glima, who are both here with us tonight, as well as John McCarthy, a current board member of Legal Aid. Amanda Korber at Legal Aid, who has mentored me over the years on landlord-tenant cases, and Amanda, if you're out there, make sure you say hello. And finally, my wife, Rebecca, who has served as the Chief of Staff at the Legal Services Corporation over the past decade and is our household's true servant of justice. Thank you again for this kind recognition. Please welcome Joan McCown, President of Legal Aid's Board of Trustees. Thank you. Uh, Matt and Aaron, thank you so much for your impressive work and your thoughtful words tonight. It's great. You know, my printed remarks are I'm supposed to say good evening, but instead I'm going to say, wow, you really showed up. I can't believe it. It's great to see everybody. But, but good evening, everyone. Um, it's an honor to serve in this role when legal aid could not be more important to our community. I want to also thank and congratulate my fellow trustees with whom I serve on the Legal Aid's Board. 
Your dedication and leadership has supported legal aid and its work during a time of unprecedented need. Thank you for everything you do for legal aid and for furthering its missions that we all care, its mission that we all care so much about. That dedication is evident not only in tonight's dinner, but in our Making Justice Real campaign, Legal Aid's biggest fundraiser each year, and a competition that engages thousands in the DC legal community every summer. It's led by associates, but supported by thousands of partners, counsel, and staff at many of the firms that are here represented tonight. Thank you so much for making justice real in addition to the, sir, attending this event. The, the Making Justice Real campaign last year was headed by, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that I'd have prior years too. I was looking at the next year. Let me, let me please recognize the 2020 honorary chair slide. Um, it was led by Carter Phillips and Virginia Seitz. They raised $3 million for the first time ever in 2020 and followed that with another record-breaking year in 2021, led by Susie Hoffman and Phil and Glima. I'm so glad that Carter, Phil, Susie are all able to join us tonight. Thank you so much for your support and leadership in the campaign. I don't know if we're going to be able to top that this year, but we're certainly going to give it a try. Also, I have to give a huge thanks to our reigning top firm, Latham & Watkins, for continuing to set the bar so high. For several years, Latham was the, first, was the first firm and for several years has exceeded $200,000 and somehow managed another record year last year by raising over $235,000. Now, whether or not that was a result of feeling some heat from Williams and Connolly, which raised over $200,000 for the first time last year is hard to say. But I know that 2021 was the first year ever that we had seven firms that raised over $100,000 each to support legal aid. I hope this wave of generosity and friendly competition continues for this summer's campaign that starts on June 6th. Now, if there is one person who we can credit more than almost anyone for rallying support for legal aid in the DC legal community, it's former executive director, Eric Angel, who stepped down after two decades of service earlier this year. Okay, at some point we're gonna make you stand up, Eric, and acknowledge that. Why don't I say a few things first? Eric first came to Legal Aid as legal director in 2001. Back then, Jonathan, Jonathan Smith was executive director and there were only 10 attorneys on staff. 10 years later, when Jonathan left Legal Aid, Eric became its executive director. During his time as executive director from 2011 to 2021, Legal Aid staff grew from 35 to nearly 90, and the organization's budget tripled. Under his leadership, each of Legal Aid's practice units expanded, the organization's presence in the community grew, and there were much, and we were able to launch new projects, such as foreclosure prevention project and an immigration project, to name a few. These made legal services more accessible to DC residents. Beyond legal aid, Eric also made an impact on the legal services community and raised the profile of the need for access to legal services as a leader of the DC Access to Justice Commission. Eric's passion for justice and his commitment to legal aid was evident. He was involved in every aspect of legal aid's work from fundraising to systemic and policy advocacy to even occasionally taking on individual cases himself. What made him remarkable as a leader was his belief in his colleagues, his compassion for clients, 
and his willingness to do anything he could to further Legal Aid's mission. Eric, thank you so much. So it took a while for us to get Eric to stand up there, but he eventually did. And that's because Eric is not one to hog the spotlight. And I know he would want me to recognize Chen Li, who is our former legal director. <laughs> Chen, Chen came into his role as Eric vacated in 2011. During his time at Legal Aid, Chen helped to bring about countless changes that have con all contributed to greater access to justice for those living in poverty. Not only did Chen oversee Legal Aid's programmatic growth during this time, he also worked with staff to expand Legal Aid's systemic work through both policy advocacy with the DC Council and agencies and through systemic litigation, all of which have broad implications for DC residents. Arguably his greatest achievement and his greatest legacy was his dedicated mentorship to a generation of public interest attorneys and leaders who have made their mark at Legal Aid and beyond for the past decade. Chen, thank you so much. We have already begun the search for a new executive director, but one thing I love about Legal Aid is that we never rest, and we are always moving forward. And I'm thrilled to introduce three extraordinary leaders who have stepped up to help lead the organization into its next chapter. Our new legal directors, Jennifer Meese, Rachel Rentelman, and Stephanie Troyer have all been legal aid, with Legal Aid for over a decade and each have served as supervisors within one, within one of Legal Aid's practice units. They have each worked with hundreds of individual clients, led citywide advocacy efforts, and mentored dozens of clients. It would take the whole evening to go through their impressive bios, but in order to give you a chance to hear from each of them tonight, I'm happily gonna stop speaking now and welcome Rachel Rentelman, Legal Aid's Legal Director for Systemic Advocacy and Law Reform to the stage. Thank you so much, Joan, for that very generous introduction. It is an honor to be with you all tonight. I am so grateful for your ongoing support of Legal Aid and for your making the time to be with us this evening. Tonight I want to talk to you about community, and I want to talk to you about justice, and what those things really mean as we begin, hopefully, to emerge from this pandemic. The last two years have emphasized the interconnectedness of our community, how much our own behaviors affect others, the need for a shared sacrifice and commitment to public health, the notion that you cannot be healthy if your neighbors are not healthy, and the fact that none of us could survive without essential workers, many of whom are the low-wage workers that Legal Aid represents, healthcare support workers, grocery store employees, and more. Many of us, including myself, were able to telework from positions of relative comfort and safety, while most of our clients have had no such privilege. Many DC workers have traded their health and even their lives for their families' economic security because even in a pandemic, the bills come due like clockwork, whether or not you can pay them. 
There can be no doubt that the pandemic has brought to the fore the deep inequities that have always existed in our community. And all too often those inequities break down along racial lines. 77% of COVID cases and 91% of COVID deaths have been people of color in the district. In the wake of the pandemic, medical and health-related debt have skyrocketed. 36% of people of color in the district have some form of debt that is actively in collections. Almost 60% of residents of color in DC have reported having had difficulty paying for basic household expenses within the last seven days. These are not just numbers. These are the people and families who make up our community. Thus, your contributions to legal aid and your pro bono representation of our clients are not acts of charity. They are investments in our shared community. Because if members of our community, including those upon whom we've relied so heavily for the last two years, if they are struggling, then we are all struggling. If we fail them, then we are failing ourselves. No doubt there is work to be done, but we are committed to doing it. Legal Aid will continue to seek justice by providing high quality and zealous representation to our individual clients. But injustice does not happen simply on an individual level. It is baked into systems and structures that oppress and marginalize low-income DC residents, particularly residents of color. Thus, our definition of justice must also include confronting those systems and structures. Justice is challenging a debt collector's right to seek a judgment against a mother of five who knows nothing about the origin of the debt and who cannot afford to have her wages garnished. But it is also working to enact legislation to overhaul DC's 50-year-old debt collection law, pushing for amendments to make DC a, a model for meaningful consumer protection. Justice is helping a young father establish parentage so he can be an active presence in his son's life. But it is also working with the courts and our community partners to establish an office inside the family court to make it easier for others to obtain assistance. Justice is helping an immigrant domestic violence survivor navigate the VAWA self-petition process so that she can live and work in the United States independent of her abuser and without fear of deportation. It is also joining our federal and local partners to oppose federal regulations that would have penalized low-income immigrants for seeking the life-sustaining public benefits to which they were entitled. Justice is helping a mom of two facing eviction obtain rental assistance and standing with her in the virtual courtroom to ensure that her scheduled eviction is canceled. Justice is also fighting for one of the strongest eviction moratoriums in the country and helping to defend it against legal attack in the DC Court of Appeals. Justice is helping a client seek, seal a decades old criminal record so that he can pursue his dream job of counseling youth in his Southeast DC neighborhood. It is also advocating for the reform of occupational licensing requirements that needlessly exclude capable workers looking for a second chance. Justice is individual, but it is also systemic. And to achieve justice, we must remember what we have learned these last two years. That is Martin Luther King Jr. so famously wrote from the Birmingham jail, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I thank you for your continued support of our work toward justice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much. And now it is my privilege, it's my privilege to introduce Public Benefits Supervising Attorney Nicole Dooley, who will be presenting our partnership award tonight. Nicole, along with many others throughout Legal Aid, mobilized to help thousands of DC residents obtain unemployment benefits while advocating with counsel, the administration, and the Court of Appeals to fix the broken application system. This work truly exemplifies the pursuit of both individual and systemic justice for our clients. Please join me in welcoming Nicole. Thank you, Rachel. And I see my panelists are joining me, so I'm going to sit down and join them. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, well, good evening. I'm honored to present this year's Partnership Award 
which honors extraordinary individuals or organizations who advanced our mission of making justice real in DC, to Tanya Love, director of the Climate Advocacy Program, and Melinda Gray, a client of the Climate Advocacy Program and Legal Aid. Ms. Gray is a native Washingtonian, a healthcare professional, and a mother of two, who lost her job and had to fight for her unemployment benefits when the pandemic began. Her former employer hired a lawyer to argue that she was not eligible for unemployment benefits and argued that no home health care aides were eligible for unemployment benefits because they were self-employed. With the help of the Claimant Advocacy Program and Legal Aid, Ms. Gray decisively won her benefits back after two levels of appeal. The Claimant Advocacy Program of the Metropolitan Washington AFL-CIO, otherwise known as CAP, provides free legal services to individuals who file unemployment appeals um, and advocate zealously for the improvement of DC's unemployment program. As its director for the past two decades, Tani has represented tens of thousands of workers in unemployment appeals hearings. Congratulations to you both, and thank you for joining me on this panel. Thank you for having us. So Tanya, my first question is for you. You've been working with legal aid for over a decade now since you started our program in 2011, um, working in unemployment insurance. We've seen a lot, but nothing like the surge that happened when the pandemic started. At that time, I know that your office went through a lot of changes, you had to switch to remote work, and there was a surge of need coming from the client community. At the same time, the Department of Employment Services, um, which administers benefits in DC, was facing that same surge. What kind of an effect did that have on workers who were applying for benefits at the time? Well, before I answer that question, I do want to acknowledge one person in the room, my partner in justice, Lolita Martin. Without her, I couldn't do this. <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge the, the person that actually founded or helped develop the Claimant Advocacy Program, and that's our former president, Jocelyn Williams. He was the president for many years um, with the Metro Washington Council, and he is the one that developed the Claimant Advocacy Program. And I know he's watching, and I said I was going to give him a shout out. <laughs> so anyway, back to your question. Um, CAP, we normally would handle, and of course, we were doing a lot of in-person appointments. We would handle maybe 30, 40 clients uh, a month, and maybe we'll take a large portion to hearings. Um, but during the pandemic, it quadrupled. Um, Lolita and I can talk about the hours of time spent, even weekends, trying to get through not just the number of claims, because as you know, the entire city shut down. And um, most of our union jobs were completely gone. So not only is just non-union, but the union jobs, the hotels, anyone that sets up like this area, IATSE, and, Oh my goodness, anyway, so everyone was, was coming, for, coming to individuals for answers and they came to CAP. So again, when it comes to, when it came to the pandemic, we had to get our legs ready. Um, we had to get the information. We had to understand the information in order to disseminate the information. And I'm not saying we got it right the first time. It took a while. Um, and then we had to coordinate with OAH, the Office of Administrative Hearings, um, as well as the OES, who actually had to implement some of these new federal programs. So it was quite interesting, I'll say. I imagine it sounds like it was tough for you. What was it like for the average claimant trying to navigate that system? Well, I think we had talked about it. There were a lot of newbies, if you will. There were people that had never filed for unemployment, didn't even know what unemployment was, was for, didn't understand the process of filing. Obviously, everything was by internet or online, so you couldn't walk into DOES, and you really couldn't at the initial stage call because the phone lines were, 
were really jammed. So it was a difficult process, but again, in order to disseminate the information in a proper way, we had to know and we had to coordinate with DOES. And in addition to that, OAH, when it came to hearings, coordinate to determine what the best plan will be, because it hadn't been implemented yet, but what the best plan will be. And it worked out. I mean, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. so. Yeah. And it's so important to have that assistance, because the benefits are essential for so many people who work in DC. Yes. Um, Ms. Gray, I know that you had to apply for unemployment benefits after your employer of many years decided that they, they didn't need you to work with them anymore. And then after you applied, they appealed your receipt of benefits. Um, they argued that you were self-employed, as I mentioned earlier, instead of, even though you'd been working for them for years. What made you decide to fight back? Well, when I first learned that my, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Okay, when I first learned that my former employer had appealed my um, unemployment benefits, I, I was truly devastated. You know, working in someone's home, you become very, it become a very personal um, situation, caring for a mother. Um, and we got to know, I got to know family members that I was stayed over for special occasions, for birthdays and all types of events. I even extended my, my service even when they didn't have a full-time care worker during the week. So it was, it was a part-time position. So um, um, when I told my hairstylist, a shout out to Diane, <laughs> she, said, she said, I was telling her about my unemployment situation and she said, Girl, <laughs> she said, you fight that. She said, you appeal that case. And it came very close to the date for me to appeal. I finally appealed it, and I came across CAP. Um, and I was introduced to Lolita. Please stand up again, please. <laughs> <laughs> Lolita is sharp as a whistle. <laughs> I had the pleasure of working with Lolita. Lolita, um, um, she came to the hearings with where well, she was my uh, my advocate and my attorney. She came to every hearing, um, just makeup to perfection, lipstick, like <laughs> very tall, and and just she demanded confidence. I mean, she just commanded the the. I mean, she just came with with the presence of. of of professionalism, maintaining her composure, and I felt a sense of confidence. Her confidence kind of like became really contagious <laughs> as I stood next to her, sat beside her, um, and she fought. She fought that case, and she won every hearing. And I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So despite that, we know that wasn't the end of your story, because even after that decisive win, your employer decided to appeal again, this time to the Court of Appeals. And that's what caused um, the referral for you to come over to legal aid. So Tanya, I know you've referred a few cases over to legal aid. Could you tell us a little bit about the partnership between CAP and legal aid? Yes, yes, I can. Um, I've, I've often partnered with, with Drake on a lot of trainings in Nicole, of course, <laughs> We brought you in. Um, so we do a lot of um, DC bar trainings on admin law, but specifically unemployment. Um, and I often sell some of my best cases to Jonathan when it goes <laughs> to the appellate level. So um, Jonathan's our appellate director. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and then we just kind of banter about the things that are going on, whether it's just UI generally, or DOES, or OAH, any changes. But yeah, we've, we've done a lot of work, and I really appreciate the partnership. And, of course, I see a lot of old partners, too, in front of me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I know start. I personally have benefited so much from it because I've learned so much from you and from Drake and Jonathan and all of my colleagues at Legal Aid. And, and I haven't met Lolita in person yet, but I'm looking forward to learning from her as well. <laughs> um, and I know, Ms. Gray, you've had the opportunity of working with both organizations. Um, you worked with Jonathan quite closely on your appeal at the Court of Appeals, which we won. Um, the court decided that home health aid workers were eligible for unemployment benefits in DC. What was it like working with Jonathan? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan took away all of that, the layers of stress that I was dealing with. Um, you know, it's never easy telling your children that you're now un unemployed. Um, they noticed my routine was changing. I was at home more. <laughs> So eventually, I had to, you know, confess that I, I was not no longer working for the family. Um, 
So um, when, when I received that call from Lolita that she could no longer represent me on the um, appellate level, um, I was devastated. I said, oh no, what's gonna happen? So she referred me to legal aid. She mentioned Jonathan. And like I said, Jonathan, I was able to, for the first time, put that file away, that unemployment file. I did not have to look at that file anymore. Even though a decision was not final, he just gave me that level of comfort that I got this, Miss Gray, I got this. <laughs> and so um, he never would say that, but you could just kind of, you know, if you could hear the implication there. <laughs> he said, don't you worry, if I need you, I'll contact you. <laughs> so um, I just appreciate um, the work that you all do. Um, I, I'm just so, uh, I'm overwhelmed um, because um, without CAP and legal aid, um, I really was not going to fight this, and with my friend Diane, I appreciate that you all litigated my case and corrected that wrong um, to make it a right. Um, I stand here, uh, I sit here rather, and my parents are here, <laughs> and um, even though I embrace this moment of fame, <laughs> um, it's them who make me really a humble person. So when I sit here, <laughs> Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. For all the healthcare workers out there, continue to wear your heart on your sleeve. Fight, fight through the struggle, the pain. Um, hitting the pavement day and night, different shifts, trying to balance work and family. Um, it's not easy. Um, and I know without your help with the case, we wouldn't have gotten that decision that changed the status for so many health workers in DC and made sure they'd be eligible for benefits. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your courage thank you. and your perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Tanya and Lolita and the rest of CAP for your um, tireless work for um, DC workers. Without you, thousands of workers would be without unemployment benefits. And without your dedication and your um, commitment to justice, they would be left without an advocate. So thank you both again also for your partnership with Legal Aid. And I, everyone, please join me in congratulating you on your partnership. With Legal Aid. Um, this concludes the first half of the program. Uh, our Servant of Justice Awards will be presented after the dinner break, so please enjoy.